this week on the Back Table Podcast. And, you know, there's um, the barking that occurred 25 years ago just can't happen anymore, right? It's all has to be uh, upfront to the point. And I find that um, I'll, I'll be honest, and maybe I shouldn't be the one bringing it up as the white male old man, I can say things differently than some of my younger colleagues that are not. And I find that incredibly frustrating as I counsel through when they get themselves in trouble with saying the exact same things I would have said. I think it is a huge challenge in today's world and uh, diversity and inclusion and growing that and making people aware of what needs to happen to make a child safe, a patient safe. Um, that sometimes there's anxiety that gets into that conversation. So, you know, one of the first things I try to teach is take your own pulse and breathe and then communicate and think about what you're going to say just for a sec, even though it's hard to do that. Welcome back to the Back Table ENT podcast. Here we bring you conversations with the best and brightest minds in the field of otolaryngology with the hope that you can take this information and apply it to your practice. I'm your host, Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at UT Southwestern here at Dallas Children's. We have a very special podcast today on pediatric airway. What's in your toolbox? What's your philosophy? My co-host today is Dr. Romaine Johnson, Associate Professor and Director of Pediatric Airway Program at UT Southwestern in Dallas. He truly is a renaissance man in our department when it comes to research, QI, just making things better and doing the right thing. You may remember him from episode five, Pediatric Tracheostomy, The Long Game, as well as episode 14, Quality and Safety in Pediatric ENT Panel Discussion. Welcome to the show, Romaine. Thank you so much for having me. And let me just say, we're also going to talk about adult airway too. Awesome. Awesome. Which brings us to how excited we are for this all-star panel. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun and interesting because we have Dr. Lara Maturka, a laryngologist, and Dr. Mark Gerber, a pediatric otolaryngologist. Dr. Maturka is an associate professor in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the Ohio State University Medical Center in Columbus. She obtained her de medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She completed her residency in otolaryngology at the Ohio State, and she went on to do fellowship in laryngology under Dr. Blake Simpson at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Welcome to the show, Dr. Materka. Thank you. You made me sound great. I, I loved it. <laughs> All right. And then we have Dr. Mark Gerber. He's a pediatric otolaryngologist with more than 20 years of experience in the medical and surgical management of complex airway, voice, and swallowing disorders in children. He obtained his medical degree from Loyola Chicago Stritch School of Medicine and completed his residency in otolaryngology at the University of Cincinnati and his fellowship at P in pediatric otolaryngology at Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati. Dr. Gerber is a chief of pediatric otolaryngology at Phoenix Children's Hospital in Arizona and a clinical professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix and Creighton University. Prior to that, he was a division head of otolaryngology head neck surgery at North Shore University Health System and a clinical associate professor of surgery at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gerber. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the mic to my co-host, Dr. Johnson, and let you lead the way. Thank you so much. Wow, an incredible resume for the, the two panelists. Uh, I know, um, I, I don't know Dr. Materko well, I, we worked to, we're both on the um, community outreach committee for the American Bronchosophological Association. We're also members of the American Laryngological Association. And of course, I do know Dr. Gerber very well. We are both Cincinnati fellows, what they commonly call cottonoids. Uh, <laughs> and so we've been, <laughs> I've known Mark since, I don't know, since I was a fellow in 2004 to 2006. If I remember correctly, uh, Mark, the Dr. Gerber, you didn't you graduate the same year as Dana? I did. Where, no, no, yeah. Dana, Dana took my desk. Dana, Dana took, came on. So you were, uh, Okay. Yeah. So very good. Uh, and so, so great. And of course, I have colleagues, um, Dr. Jachana, Chris Jachana at The Ohio State. And Prashant uh, Maholtra. We yeah. were in residency together. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, a, it's a small world. Of course, everybody knows Dr. Blake Simpson, who is hilarious and such a <laughs> great conversationalist great mentor and, and yeah, mentor. Great 
Um, so tell us a little bit about your stories. Maybe Dr. Maturka, we could start with you. How did you get to where you are? And then maybe talk a little bit about what drew you to become an airway doctor. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I got into ENT. I mean, it, it was almost pure chance, good, good chance. But um, but then once I was an ENT resident, um, I think like so many people, I ended up in laryngology just because my my mentor was a laryngologist. And um, I really, I struggled between head and neck and laryngology. And so I guess once I settled on laryngology, it probably made sense that with the pull toward head and neck that that airway attracted me. Um, really Blake, Blake Simpson is probably who uh, most made me um, just really excited about airway stuff, um, mostly endoscopic. And then as my career has gone on more and more open approaches and um, yeah, I just, you know, it's a, it's a nice balance. I think sometimes in laryngology, we feel like plastic surgeons of the voice and it, it can feel a little fluffy. Um, so I love, uh, I love the airway side of my practice to balance it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very happy though. And in, in uh, you know, with an airway practice and, and very doable, I think, despite what it might sound like. What about you, Mark? So I, um, uh, when I, I got lucky. I mean, I think every step through training, through life, doors open, doors close. Um, after medical school in Chicago, I got lucky enough to land my residency in Cincinnati. Um, what I didn't know as a young person is um, the uh, breadth of the pediatric otolaryngology program in Cincinnati. Uh, and having the opportunity to be a young resident under the Robin Cotton uh, and his crew was just a phenomenal opportunity. And um, it, uh, unlike Dr. Maturka, I had zero interest. In, I loved the surgeries for head and neck, but I just could not relate to the head and neck cancer patient. And I very easily drew myself into peds. Um, and if those that know me, they know I am still just a big old child with gray hair. So um, I, I easily slid into the idea of pediatric otolaryngology and the airway with the huge number of cases that I saw. Um, you know, I'm a, severe, I'm a slow learner. I was the last of the two years of general surgery along with my four years of ENT residency. So I was in Cincinnati for eight years uh, between my two years, the, 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 that and then the additional two years of the fellowship. So um, I became a Cincinnati and my family was all from Cincinnati. And I just, that, that experience there really uh, solidified. By the time I left, I felt like a very comfortable airway surgeon. And the, unlike adult laryngology, the voice side of pediatric airway, uh, we're, still in, we're still neophytes. We're still learning how to figure out to manage the voice. So while I was training, it was all about airway and the voice was secondary. Now we're working on preserving voice at the same time as fixing the airways. We're thinking about it up front. It's just a fascinating time to be a pediatric airway surgeon. I'm, I'm loving this. Very good. You know, that's a, talk. Let's talk about that voice piece. Cause you know, obviously I'm a airway physician too, and do a lot of pediatric open reconstruction and also have a voice clinic. So I see a lot of the consequences of longstanding uh, voice problems in the former preemie. I'm curious with Dr. Maturka, or do you see that sort of 18 to 22 year old, 18 to 25 year old who had surgery from Dr. Cotton and Dr. Gerber, you know, back in the 90s and, you know, the early 2000s and you're like, oh yeah, the, I, you know, can, do you see those kind of patients and what, what's your experience on the, on the back end? Yeah. Um, no, you guys managed it all fine. We we don't ever see them. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. that's, that's, that's especially it. the ones coming from I Dallas. I love those lies. <laughs> <laughs> um, in in truth, we we actually don't that often though, and I think some of it is that um, patients learn to adjust and live with it. And um, I've had a few patients like that who've come through, and it's interesting because just as often they come through for something unrelated and you, you go, okay, are we also going to be checking into your voice too? And they'll say, oh, that's just me. And we'll, we'll dig a little and they'll say, yeah, yeah, I had surgery years ago and, and it's fine. Don't worry about that part. Or occasionally they'll, they'll be here for that. And, um, 
And it is, you do make a good point though, because um, those situations are tough. There's not always much we can offer someone who's had a problem, whatever the problem is, the more years it's gone on um, without being addressed, you know, our, our hope for improving it goes down a little bit. I've, I've had a few really longstanding vocal fold paralysis patients come through like that. And um, they certainly still get benefit from medializations and things like that, but it's, um, it's not quite the same. So doing it well upfront really is important, but, but in all seriousness, I, I truly think that um, you guys do pay close attention to that. And, and because of it, I, I don't think we see as much as we would or, or, or did 10, 20 years ago. What are some of the things, Dr. Gerber, that, you know, if you see a new fellow coming up, you know, first year fellow, what are the things that you know today about airway reconstruction in the pediatric airway that you, that you want that fellow to learn as fast as possible so they'll be a better surgeon, a better airway physician? Oh, that's a great question. Um, without an easy answer, right? Um, yeah. I think there's um, a lot of tidbits that come with time and experience. Sometimes I think the most important thing is knowing when to operate you know, and um, being flexible in your approach. Um, I, there's many times that um, now in a, in a leadership role back in a PEDS world, I have a lot of opportunity to guide and mentor. And I see a lot of cases that come up for discussion that really the best answer is more time, uh, patience. And I, so I think part of it is knowing when to operate. Don't get overzealous. The, when, when the time, you'll know when the time's right. Um, and then being flexible, uh, not being stuck with blinders in your approach. Uh, I think those are two very important things. You make I a agree. good point, Mark. Um, I, you know, I was Johnson's fellow, so I was, I guess, a Johnsonoid of the group. <laughs> but uh, you know, and when we do airway, and I, I do primarily sinus. I mean, I feel comfortable with like endoscopic, you know, Nikki picky babies, but I'm not the main open airway surgeon. Um, and I remember as a fellow, I'd be like, so how, how do you know? And Dr. Johnson would always say, oh, it's it's the gestalt. And he has this like way he does, well, he says that because there's like a little dance to it. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have the gestalt. What do you mean by the gestalt? And I, I think it's time experience and that then knowing when to operate will come and being open and flexible is, is part of that. So I, I, I get it. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure out that gestalt, uh, age, weight, airway reactivity, um, overall health of the patient. So I have seen more and more over the years where if you have a two-year-old who undergoes a double stage LTR, it fails dramatically. And then you take that same patient at four, you do the same operation and it's a revision and they heal beautifully. And you're like, well, <laughs> it's the same surgery. Why did it? And I think sometimes it's the body's capacity to heal is what you're stressing. And it can be difficult to know when that moment comes. Do, do you have the same sort of struggles? I'm sure you do, Dr. Maturka, but <laughs> it, please uh, just humor us with uh, how do you make those decisions? How do you decide in the adult world? Yeah, well, I think um, I, for me, I think one thing that, that I've found difficult is that uh, most patients who need an open airway reconstruction um, they're, the reason they need it is because they're they're sick. They got a million comorbidities, and and it's almost like the nature of the need is is going to dictate you know a, a terrible background and, and make them a bad candidate right off the bat. So, um, you know, I started to realize that every candidate was not a good candidate, and you got to just start doing them. And um, even really sick patients, if you prepare you know thoroughly, they'll do okay. I, I've almost come to to fear the young, healthy patient more because a lot of times they're in their situation because of it, an inherent propensity towards scar that is maybe even harder to deal with. Um, and and I, I wanna go back if I can to, you know, I, I think a question that you were asking about what, what do you want trainees to learn first? And um, what can you teach an intern that you, you just can't teach um, that, that only experience can teach and, and then what can you really teach them? And at least in our world, it's all about um, 
it's all about setup. I, I just want them to know what instruments to ask for, and then they can learn how to use them later. But um, I, I always say to patients or, or other consultants that, you know, you don't really want me so much as you want my tools. And, um, and I think that's where, where we can do right by our trainees is, is just in um, helping them understand how to prepare for an airway case um, or, or even just on your way into the hospital for an emergent airway. And, um, and the experience will come. And then, of course, you know, then you really get into it with choosing who you're going to operate on. What is, you know, that's one of the things with the toolbox, right? The airway mm -hmm. toolbox. What are the things that you need when you're going to do an airway case consistently? What are some of the things that you all feel like that's got to be on the back table, every airway case, no matter what? Um, I mean, for me, it's, um, I, I did my whole triologic thesis at answering this question. And, and um, for me, I try to use the same setup for every difficult airway, even, even if I'm not going to need some of the things just for consistency sake and, and a, a good scope, a good subglottoscope. In my case, I love the um, extended length or the, it's called the Garrett extension of the Ossoff filling scope. That's just an absolute go-to for me. You can jet ventilate through it there. I love it when I get the chance to have a, a resident try to expose someone with maybe a saddle off scope. They, they can't and then they try again with that scope and, and just see how, what a difference a good scope makes. Um, and then I could go on answering this question forever. So I want to make sure everyone else gets a chance. <laughs> I'm listening to Dr. Maturka saying I need to do a better job at teaching that is what I'm saying up to up front. I'm a little bit of like, you give me a butter knife, I will take care of the problem. So I am not as much of a planner. So uh, I think that is an incredible point that I've just learned something. I'm not too old to learn something new. I think it's it just reminds me, yes. Um, if I have a trainee in my room and we're getting set up for a case, I am talking about the instruments and what I want up there in front of me as I prepare for the individual case. And I'm taking, I'm sort of looking around the room. If it's open, I'm less worried. If it's an endoscopic case, I'm much more uh, attentive to the instrumentation, uh, the appropriate size uh, laryngoscope, the appropriate size telescopes, you know, depending on the size of the child. Uh, whether or not I'm going to need a, uh, a bronchoscope or a tracheoscope uh, at times, um, where just the opening is only at the distal end. So there are uh, those things I'm very attentive to in endoscopic and open. Uh, I worry about it a little bit less. Uh, when it's open, am I going to be wanting a drill to take care of a, of a thick posterior cricoid plate if I'm doing a, a cricotracheal resection? Um, little things like that. Um, and suture, if I'm doing a slide tracheoplasty, um, those things are important. What suture do you guys like for the airway? I always go back and forth. Do you do the proline? Do you do PDS? Do you like Vicryl? Do you think it matters, particularly for anastomosis type work? Well, for me, I have, I trained with proline, 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 and proline, right? That was all that Cotton used. So, you know, Dr. I am a, I, I, you know, I'm now an older cottonoid, um, but you know, it took me a long time to start to transition to using PDS. So those that were trained by Dr. Rudder and company thereafter, um, that PDS use was natural. For me, it was unnatural, but I've made that, you know, switch. Um, I'm doing a lot of slides. Even my CTRs end up as a modified slide. Um, so I'm using PDS. All, not, um, for graphs, I'm still using my proline, but for slides, I'm using PDS and the double armed, and I'm usually running it, you know, for quite a bit of it. Yeah, I mean, I um, one one little pearl, I guess, is that I like to use prolines. I use uh, bike rolls when I'm sewing the posterior wall, but um, I, I use for traction or stay sutures. I use Maxons, and and the color they switched over our whole hospital, uh, whatever our supplier is, and now the colors are are more similar, and um, and that silly detail has has made it harder. So, um, so some of it is is just stuff like that. The, there's a lot of good materials and it probably doesn't matter as much as we think it does. You know, maybe mucosal versus submucosal or luminal versus not is a is a bigger question. But um, but yeah, I, I don't like I need my greens and my blues need to look a lot different. So <laughs> 
Talk more about the mucosal versus submucosal. It's a, a new emerging concept. Yeah, I first started thinking about it when I was assisting a thoracic surgeon years ago, and and he said, um, oh, he said it, it really, it, you know, everyone overthinks that. Don't worry about it. It's okay if if it passes mucosally, and. Um, but I disagree. I mean, I, I try hard not to have it pass me coastally, um, unless I'm, I'm just really struggling with a, a case or, or a redo or something. And, and because, I mean, I've, I've found when I can see a little bit of color um, endoscopically afterwards, they're just simply more likely to get granulation tissue there. And, and it's true that sometimes it's not clinically significant or it doesn't lead to sequela, but sometimes it does. So I, yeah, I, I really do like to stay submucosal. Yeah, I, I tend to say submucosal as well. Uh, I use PDS and it. I switched to PDS primarily because it, dehiscence. And so I just, maybe you guys never have a dehiscence, but <laughs> I just, I, you know, if a proline dehisces, you got to go out and you got to get it out. Where from PDS dehisces, it eventually goes away. So I, I pick my poison, but I do think proline is less reactive. And I think you have less granulation tissue when you use proline suture than PDS suture. Um, I think PDS is much more reactive. And sometimes I wonder, do I see more um, prolonged inflammation after surgery because I switched to PDS compared to when I used proline many years ago? But I've, I've decided to just stick with it because I think the the margin of harm, if you will, is is relatively low. Can you got you mentioned earlier? Both of you mentioned mentors. So you mentioned Dr. Cotton. You mentioned Dr. Simpson. Who are some of your other mentors? And or tell me how those two individuals sort of helped you uh, along the way and gave you a better feel for for what it meant to be a, a good airway physician, a good laryngologist, a good pediatric laryngologist, otolaryngologist. So I'll I'll back up to the to the suture question for two seconds and just say so I, I've switched over to that PDS for all but graphs, um, but what I've also done with my slides is started uh, a horizontal mattress so that I get better eversion, and that I think is the single biggest thing that has cut down on granulation. Um, the, I didn't come up with it, but I've definitely been a utilizer of it. And I think it's, it's a phenomenal technique um, that takes away the figure of eight if you're doing a congenital uh, slide. And even for a mid-tracheal slide in an older person, that horizontal mattress change really um, gives me nice aversion. So I'm not getting that buildup into the airway. Um, in terms of mentors, I don't know why, um, but I was a very young resident and Dr. Cotton had found out that I was, he was, he was staying in a duplex while his house was being redone, uh, literally down the block from me. And I was a second year in general surgery, but I was on the ENT service and he walks into my room and says, and asked me where I'm living. And I'm like, all right, well, I told him. And then about 10 o'clock at night, a couple of nights later, he had three schnauzers at the time and he knocks on my door and, and just comes and says hi. And just, we sat down and just chatted for about an hour. Uh, I was like, thank God I was dressed. <laughs> but my relationship with him only got better from there. And really uh, as a mentor, um, and you can include, you know, Dr. Wilging, who was a young attending and Dr. Meyer and Dr. Schott, all the folks that were there just really, um, each one has, uh, you know, done a lot for me in terms of teaching me how to be a better person, a better otolaryngologist, and an airway surgeon. Um, let alone becoming a dad and, you know, raise starting my family. I, I think that's that's what this, in some ways, is all about: is the training and the mentorship, and it continues through the organizations that we're a part of as we age and now getting to be, you know, the old man and and having a bunch of children of my own in the practice that we're in, it's, 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 it's a ton of fun. Yeah, I feel like I could talk about mentors. We could do a whole podcast on it. And one, one neat thing in our field, I think, is just how many different mentors I've had. I mean, even people I met just in fellowship interviews ended up becoming mentors um, because of the day or two I spent during the interview. And um, we're, we're really lucky um, in, in, well, both of our fields in, in, 
laryngology, there's just so many people and it's so tight of a community. We're in ENT in general, we're, we're very lucky. But um, so Blake Simpson, of course, is, is as my fellowship director and, and just good friend. Um, I mean, I, I can't overstate his influence. Um, Rick Forrest actually is, he was one of the early Vanderbilt fellows and he was, um, yeah, he's still with us at Ohio State and does still practices a little bit, but he, he was a huge mentor for me and, and maybe exactly why I was struggling between head and neck and laryngology because he did a laryngology fellowship and he also did one of the first free flap fellowships. So he taught most of our current head and neck attendings, how to do free flaps. Then he went and started up the laryngology division. So he's been a huge influence on me. And then, um, and then finally, ALA had a, I think it was ALA, had a, had a neat program a few years ago where they would match people up. And um, Mark Corey became a, a mentor of mine through that and really took me all the way through my trilogic thesis, um, helped me vet a lot of ideas and, and just, I mean, no obligation to me to spend the amount of time that he did. So, um, oh, I, I mean, I've just been so lucky the whole way, the whole way through, not to mention even my current partners, um, our, our whole practice, you know, I was a resident under many of them. And now as, as partners, just seeing how they treat their patients, you know, not the, the clinical management, but just the, how to be a doctor, you know, how to be a good, good doctor to people. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the trilogical side. I think all three of us are members, and and of course, Dr. Shaw is was just nominated this year. Hey, to, uh, yes. to, she's I'll reach got to She's got to write yeah. her thesis. Uh, so I, you know, I think Trio has been a great organization to to find mentoring, and I, you know, obviously Dr. Cotton and Dr. Wilkie and Dr. Shot and everyone you can think of on the pediatric side, and as well as on the the adult laryngology side belongs to that society. So I'm just going to give a shout out to the trial society for anyone listening and uh, you can you can do it you can write your thesis you can become a member start working on it today it'll pay off dividends in ways uh, I can't uh, even tell you anyway so let's get back to talking surgery let's talk open airway when do you when do you when do you do it I know you, you got choices you can do endoscopic you can do open Open is still sort of the, you know, the, the game, if you will. It's, it's how you define yourself as a surgeon, I think. How to, but obviously, it has more risk. And uh, so I'm curious, what, is your, what, what are some of the pearls in your decision-making, seeing a patient saying, this is a good open reconstructive case. This is not an open, this is not a good open re reconstructive case. I think for me, um, it's always easier if there's a trach. I, I, I can be patient and, and wait and bide my time. Uh, when you have a child who's undergone, you know, who doesn't have a trach and who's undergone attempts at endoscopic management that fail, how do you define failure? Um, is it, you know, two or three? You know, I, I've seen kids who show up having had a dozen endoscopic attempts and, um, you know, that, that's too much. Where, where is that dividing line? And again, there is a gestalt there, right? Because um, sometimes it may be better that you put a trach in and wait and do that later. And other times you turn away right there and, and set up for your endoscope for your open reconstruction. But um, I like to be able to study my kids. So for the pediatric population, you know, I want to be able to do a flex scope what's happening with the super, superglottic and glottic dynamics, what's their feeding history. Um, I wanna make sure I study that so I'm not presuming anything. So either a fees or a, a video fluoroscopic study. Um, I wanna be able to do uh, my you know, endoscopic assessment with the kids asleep and include a, a, a BAL so I'm getting cultures. Um, and then this is the one time that I'm also pretty anal about managing reflux. And it's not reflux disease. I'm managing reflux and how it can affect the outcome of airway reconstruction for a child. So I want all of those kids to have an EGD with biopsy. I want to make sure I'm not dealing with EOE. And, and you know, for the kids that I'm able to, I want to do a voice analysis. So all of those things um, are my perfect setup. And if I, all the stars line up, um, then I'm ready. Sometimes I can't wait for the stars to line up and you're forced. Right. If you see a 
if, if I start an endoscopy and when I'm done with an endoscopy, I'm pretty much hands off. I'm not using a sheathed bronchoscope when I'm looking at an airway. So I'm just putting in telescopes most of the time. And if I come out with a telescope and I already see effacement of the ventricular space, that's not really an airway I wanna manipulate yet, right? So all those things are, you know, play a role. And then the severity of the stenosis, what are the, what are the obviously a grade three stenosis or worse if you're talking about subglottis uh, or tracheal, right? If you have uh, significant effacement and, and symptomatic uh, in a child that doesn't have a trach, then I think those are the ones you have to go after and choosing to do it open versus putting in a temporary trach. Now, since I've been in, in Arizona and I've seen the population, which I know, Romaine, you came into uh, in getting to Texas, is the decision-making on putting in a trach for these families. I've been pushed many times already to do that reconstruction because I have a family that just uh, can't handle a tracheotomy. And so I'm taking added risk to avoid and sometimes I win and sometimes I lose, but I've done my best. But there's um, that also plays a role in the decision-making process. So I'm, I'm trying to think of concepts that will kind of span across pediatric and adult airway both. And I, I think this maybe is one, but one, one problem that I've had in my own practice, and maybe I'm going to raise more questions and answer, but... Um, you know, we see a lot of idiopathic subglottic stenosis patients, and I find that considering open uh, approaches for them is the very hardest decision I have to make uh, because they have so much, at least in my mind, they have so much more to lose. And so I think that, you know, if you have a patient who's otherwise pretty healthy and functional and you can temporize with endoscopic approaches, and I mean, in, in our population, that temporize might mean a couple of years even, um, but then you follow them 10 years and, and now you've operated on them eight times and, and you go, you know, is this okay? And it's such a personal decision in the adult group. So that's, that's one area that I struggle with a little bit. You know, I, I feel like I might um, continue longer with endoscopic approaches, even if they're needing them every couple of years, just because they do so well with them. It's an outpatient surgery and the patients themselves are, are hesitant to take that risk. As far as patients with or without a trach, I mean, I'd rather not put a trach in just for surgical ease. You know, I find it much easier to do the case um, if I can do it based only on where that stenosis is and not have to worry about the trach positioning. But, uh, but, but it is true, you know, if you have a patient who's already trach dependent, um, you sure have a lot less to lose in doing that open reconstruction. And then, and then just as Dr. Gerber said, there's absolutely patients who you're, you're just so fearful of them being out in the world with a trach. You, you just, you know, they don't really understand it and, and they don't have any kind of, um, you know, the, all the teaching and education you do just isn't landing. And, and those are patients where, yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've operated on some when they, they still weren't as healthy as I wanted them to be and, and we got them through it. And um, so, yeah, it's, boy, it's a nuanced decision. It's, it's not easy. So oh, you, Dr. Gerber mentioned earlier sort of protocols. Yeah, I mentioned, oh, God, I want to do a voice analysis. I want to get a swallow study. I want to do an EGD. Forgive me, but do you do the same thing in the adult world? I, I haven't heard of that sort of thinking. Is that something that's also done with adult airway reconstruction? Yeah, to a degree, not maybe in the same way. I actually, believe it or not, when I was at um, Cincinnati as a student, I did a project on whether um, clearing a, a kids for EOE before open airway reconstruction was financially solvent or not. Um, and there's another mentor, uh, Ravi Ellaru, when he was, was with you guys. And so, you know, we're not looking for EOE. We're not, um, I I'm not doing voice analyses in men. Now in women where I think they might need a CTR, yes, I think that's very important. Um, and, and maybe it's not even the analysis that's important so much as the counseling because they will get a, a deeper voice. It, even in men, you, you need to tell them that. Um, sometimes they're a little alarmed by it, uh, by how manly they sound. They usually like it though. So the, the, Recent change in my practice is that more and more often I'm doing formal pH probes in my patients first, um, especially if they have that, you know, you talked about the ventricular effacement, um, you know, if, if, if we're seeing a lot of signs of, of inflammation, um, 
I've, I've had a few patients in my practice who were requiring uh, recurrent endoscopic attempts. And in preparation for open, we went ahead, they ended up getting a Nissen because they had such significant reflux and they stopped needing anything. You know, I dilated them at the beginning of the case. The general surgeon came in, did the Nissen, and they flew. So I, I'm relying more and more heavily on that. But there aren't, there aren't good protocols in our world. Do you use PFTs? I use them really heavily. It's sort of a, a thing, a, a research interest of mine. But again, I don't know that others are. I mean, I have, we stock peak flow devices in my clinic. You know, our airway patients um, get get one. We used to keep a box with everyone's peak flow and we'd pull out the, the individual patients. Now we just give them a new one every time. But um, yeah, personally, I, I love I love peak flows, full PFTs uh, when I can get them and peak flows every visit. So uh, Dr. Gerber, it, besides just making sure you don't injure the recurrent laryngeal nerve, do you think there are things you can do in particular to reduce the incidence of post airway reconstruction dysphonia? I think it's it's really um, choosing the right operation in a way, right? So part of it is is don't try to do a, a third rib graft when there's no good solid cartilage to attach that to, right? Um, because you're only going to get more scarring and collapse and affect that's going to affect the voice quality. Minimize manipulation of the supraglottic tissues. So I try to stay away from that cricoarytenoid joint unless I have to be there. The, you know, I worry a lot about the extended cricotracheal resection. I tend to actually try to do it separate. So if I've got a combined um, posterior glottic issue along with a severe stenosis distally, um, there are times I'll do an endoscopic posterior graft knowing I've not fixed the child, but I've just fixed the posterior glottic aspect and then go in later, open and do my CTR, that separates it. I know it's two operations. I've not written about it yet, but to me, I think that it's, I've had good outcomes with it because I'm not trying to get all that healing going at once and all those forces that I think collapse inward. So minimizing manipulation of uh, mucosal surfaces, being very cognizant of that uh, cricoarytenoid area when you're doing an open reconstruction. Um, and of course, the anterior commissure as well, right? Um, so it really depends on what you're starting with, but I uh, nothing makes me more upset um, at myself if I've started with a good looking glottic aperture and then I end up with something that's worse uh, following reconstruction because of unrecognized, you know, uh, you know, difficulties with the healing process, whether it's infection or inflammatory, the things we don't quite yet understand in terms of how these children heal. If we could only predict how the kids are going to heal, uh, just like adults, I get frightened of that adult. I still think rib grafts would be, would work well in adults. I don't, I have some uh, experience in adult rib grafts, but I think, you know, adults are much more difficult to predict how they're going to heal um, than some of the kids. I agree. I was thinking about one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys was about tech. And we sort of talked about it earlier, you know, pediatric or otolaryngology in general, we, we use a lot of great technology. And uh, Dr. Maturka, you've mentioned the special scopes that you like. And Dr. Gerber, you said, well, I just give you a butter knife and I'll, I'll get it their way. Uh, is there anything like, is there any other tech that you really enjoy that makes your job much easier when you, as you do your airway reconstructions or endoscopic, open, whatever. And is there any tech that you that you use, but man, you wish it was better or just something else? If you had this this idea, this this piece of tech, it would just it would make things so much better. I can start with the latter question, um, and I don't know if this is. Uh, you, you can't tell this on this podcast, but I'm about five feet tall. And I don't know if this is because of that or because I'm a woman, but um, the T&E scope is a big thing in our field um, that it, it's just not made for a small hand. And frankly, I, I don't think it's made for most people's noses either. It's just a little bit bigger than it needs to be. And it's not easy to manipulate. And 
people are really excited about it, but I've just um, gotten farther and farther away from it as time goes on instead of embracing it. So that's, that's my, this is my plea for, for someone out there, you know, an Olympus or, or uh, Pentax to fix that scope and the ergonomics of the hand, the hand piece. I'm not, I, I think the, in, in, in 2021 post COVID, the expense of some of this technology, right? Um, it's not going away. It's not going to get cheaper, but yet our ability to afford it is affected by what's gone on. I mean, pediatric otolaryngology has been affected, affected probably more than just about any other field in terms of our, you know, OR volumes for the simple things that we do. The, 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 the difficult cases are still there, but it's the simple things that actually fund what we do. Airway surgery is not something that we do expecting remuneration. It's, um, but I think the, the difficulty I have as a, as a leader it, it is being able to justify the um, distal chip scopes, the video endoscopes, um, which I think are crucial, but it's new. I've got a very young children's hospital that has a lot of fiber optic scopes and, and changing those over to better technology is very expensive. And in a world today where it's very difficult to, to justify uh, huge expenses, I, I find that very difficult. I mean, we have a pa patient population that needs that and um, it's not easy to get it, especially when they are treating uh, non-lumen scopes like a scope with a lumen in terms of the cleaning needs when you're at a major children's hospital. So um, the, all those forces together make it a very difficult time uh, so that's my wish for technology is somehow make it less expensive so that we can bring that technology down to the kids that need it. That's an excellent point. I, I, just to answer the question myself, the, the thing that, uh, so I, I don't, maybe it's 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we, we were doing a surgery and, and there was a complication and we, patient, we got the patient through it, but I realized how difficult it is to see what the resident sees. And so for me, I've, it's been a struggle, some success, some failure to find a way to, to develop imaging. So when the, when the resident operates, I can see what they're seeing. And when they're scoping a patient in the ED or in the, in the ICU, to be able to give those images to you, not just describe, but actually show me the images. And, you know, there's tech, there's iPhone apps and things like that. But the images aren't great, but they're better. But that's one area where I hope to get really good, uh, high fidelity, sort of high def if, if, or visualization of images that can be shared widely amongst a treating team uh, so you can get rapid diagnosis. Like, hey, I see this patient in the emergency room. Hey, let me look up and see what you saw. Like, no, 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 that was, that was clearly a papilloma. There's, the vocal cords aren't moving, but I don't know why we need to we need to think about doing something else. So to me, that's the, the tech in terms of teaching and taking care of, of patients. Well, we're, we're winding down a little bit. Uh, do you guys have anything that, that you would like to just can say? I, yeah. Can I just ask one last question? I really, what uh, stuck out to me and what's always stuck out to me about uh, whether it's endoscopic or open airway is the importance of communication. And you both touch on that, you know, whether it's uh, discussing uh, tracheostomy with your families to uh, understand, you know, tracheostomy teaching to go set up this. I'll be in the hospital in five minutes. I know we have this airway form body. Please go talk to the tech about getting the room set up. What do you guys think is our effective ways to communicate. And as, you know, surgeons in the OR, um, I, I feel like the case starts with how we communicate. Part of our setup is how we communicate. What do you think are effective ways? I think it's a great question. And, you know, there's um, the barking that occurred 25 years ago just can't happen anymore, right? It's all has to be uh, upfront to the point. And I find that um, and I'll, I'll be honest, and maybe I shouldn't be the one bringing it up as the white male old man, I can say things differently than some of my younger colleagues, colleagues that um, are not. And I find that incredibly frustrating as I counsel through when they get themselves in trouble with saying the exact same things I would have said. 
I think it is a huge challenge in today's world and uh, diversity and inclusion and growing that and making people aware of what needs to happen to make a child safe, a patient safe, um, that sometimes there's anxiety that gets into that conversation. So being able to take your own pulse, to slow your breath, and to effectively communicate is the best way to go about it, even when you're stressed. Um, you know, one of the first things I try to teach is take your own pulse and breathe and then communicate and think about what you're going to say just for a sec, even though it's hard to do that. Um, and, and being proactive, right? The more you can think about it, Dr. Maturka, I think I can already tell you are thinking ahead and that's a great thing. I will tell you that in my personality, I'm not as good at that. So I have to think about that when I have a trainee, right? So I have to stop myself recognize I have a trainee with me because we don't have enough trainees where I'm at. Uh, it's always been a hit or miss. So I have to stop and think. And then it's the communication also as an airway surgeon, your anesthesiologist is your right arm. So communicating up front. And sometimes when I have a friend that's the anesthesiologist in the room with me, I may presume that they know what I'm thinking. And then it's like, oh, we were not on the same page. We're, so backing up, thinking that through, um, and communicating. And I think just stopping and breathing is a very important point. And I think that would get uh, a lot of the conversations I end up having to have probably wouldn't be needed if we just stopped and breathed. But, and we have a long, long, long way to go in terms of uh, recognizing uh, the roles of, uh, of each of the people in the room um, and the importance of every single person in the room, right? Yeah, I... I... Absolutely echo all of that. Um, this is this is another area of interest, and uh, we we published an airway communication protocol a few years ago that um, really speaks to the importance of finding your anesthesiologist before you go in the room. In having sort of an algorithm you go through with everyone there, um, and and part of it is just especially you know to address what you mentioned. One of my fellows uh, told me that he used it, and I think it sort of proves my point. But part of it is that you need to be able to signal to everyone that you know what you're doing, and that you have a plan. And I think when you go through some of these, you know, use these protocols. Um, I think what happens a lot of times is is um, some of the the heavy-handed personalities in the room maybe go, oh gosh, I think she's thought about this a whole lot more than I have, so maybe I'll just, you know, step back a little bit. And and um, so I, I I've encountered some of that myself, and I think it's it's helped so much um, to to kind of lay it all out there ahead of time and and to know everyone's name, so that if there is you know part of the protocol that I think is important is to say. Uh, you know, to to point to my scrub tech and say, hey, Michelle, if we're not getting good chest rise, you're the one that needs to hand me that balloon dilator right away. And, you know, then I turn to the circulator and can you show me where it's sitting right now? You know, where where the balloon is sitting and and that kind of thing um, is, is huge. You know, I mean, I remember as a resident so many times um, watching M&Ms, or I guess as a medical student, really, um, about codes that went poorly. And so many times what it came down to was that the person running the code would ask for something, they identified the needs, but they wouldn't designate someone to do it. So those little details end up being huge. You know, you can do all the right things, make all the right decisions, stay calm. And if you, if you overlook some of those nuances in a really touchy airway situation, that, that can make or break it. You raise a really good point about if you need help, you, you can't just say, somebody help me. You have to, you're more likely to get the help you need if you point to someone or designate someone, can okay. you help me? That person is much more likely to help you. Anyway, I that was an excellent uh, comment, Dr. Shaw. You could tell she's a pro at this. Uh, and so anyway, I, we, we're winding down. And I just wanted to get you all's last thoughts and pearls of wisdom um, as we kind of round things up about the, the airway experience. Uh, I don't know if that, I, this was a great experience for me. I hope that your listeners found it helpful. The, uh, you know, I take away something from all of these conversations. Um, so I appreciate and thank you for inviting me to join you. Thanks for coming. 
yeah, for me, I suppose I, I'm glad that that Gopi ended it with the the discussion about communication. I mean, that's that's probably my biggest pearl is, uh, you know, preparing and and thinking about positioning and using your paralytic and all those things are really important. But you know, if you're working with an intern, you need to focus on what they can do well and um, and expecting them to have you know, the hands or to be able to expose, not so much, but they can, they can choose the right instruments to call for and, um, and to adjust it as you're getting more experienced residents and, and helping them to recognize, you know, who they do, they really do need to worry about. And I, I think one other really important point to emphasize um, is, Romaine, your, Dr. Johnson, I mean, your point, <laughs> your point about, you um, being able to share technology and being better teachers, that's, I, I, I don't think that can be overlooked. I used to work in a rural medicine um, uh, setting and I, I would use the kind of crappy fiber optic scope they had there. And then sometimes they had to come up to OSU and get strobed on my good, my good tower and I would change my own diagnosis. And it made me realize that we're expecting trainees to use this equipment when they don't even have the diagnostic skills, much less good equipment. And how on earth are they going to progress? How are how are they going to get any feedback if we're not looking at what they're looking at? And I think that's that's a bigger issue um, and and one that should be highlighted. Um, and thank you again. Uh, this was great. I don't so, know if y'all, yeah. Dr. Johnson has a uh, he introduced an adapter to our iPhones that then go on the scopes, and that's been a game changer in terms of consults, whether it's our APPs to our uh, resident intern on call for uh, bedside laryngoscopy, uh, bedside nasal endoscopy, uh, you know, for vocal cord evaluations after cardiac surgery to invasive fungal sinusitis and our um, immunocompromised patients. And that has been a huge game changer with us. I, I think a simple modification for technology. So it is a little case that you can put on the iPhone that has an adapter to your um, uh, flexible scopes. That's pretty, and then you can record it and then review it in slow-mo and it gives you a better idea in terms of do, do the cords work or not. I mean, I, I can't always tell and then I have to do the slow-mo and I'm like, okay, I think that one side is weak or whatnot. So that's been definitely a great addition. So one of the things I always talk about it, in my talks is about, you know, when you're an otolaryngologist, the contributions you need to make or you should make. And one of the big contrib contributions is community service. You know, Dr. Gerber and Mark is part of the American Society of Pediatric Laryngology, the Quality and Safety Committee. Laura is part of the uh, ABEA's Community Outreach Committee, and they're sharing their, their experiences with us. And for you in the audience, please consider joining these organizations, participating in these organizations, and um, so you can also make the similar contributions. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, sorry. No, thank you all for being, taking the time. Uh, it was great to meet everybody and uh, you know, learn from each other. Um, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. You can find us on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, iHeartRadio. Please remember to rate, like, and subscribe. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Backtable ENT. We love feedback, suggestions, or if you wanna to come to the show. If you take anything from today's show, take a breath, check your pulse, and make sure you know some names. Have a good day, it's a wrap. 